So, hello, I am super, super excited. This is the Romford Sessions, I think I'm going to be calling it. We have teamed up. We are teaming up with a festival. This is really exciting. I actually, yeah, I'm, I'm brimming with joy on this one. So tonight I am joined with Mr. Spencer Hawken, the poster boy of the Romford Film Festival and the master of films, aka Kaleidoscope Man, aka... <laughs> Peter Blunden himself. How are you two guys tonight? I'm Hi. <laughs> Don't all jump in at once and uh, start answering questions here. <laughs> I like to do that thing, you know, like where you like wait for the other person because I obviously yeah. appreciate that I'm the most important person in the room. I always like to wait for the secondary person. <laughs> so is everyone looking forward because uh, we are a little bit late in getting this episode done. This is the inaugural episode of the Romford Film Festival. This is for the Horrific Festival which is coming this weekend. Spencer, you're going to have to talk me through that one. It does not roll off the tongue, my friend. And later on in the month, we have got the main festival which we're going to be doing lots of coverage for as well. But we want to get this done for the weekend because we have the big inaugural horror festival. How, how are you guys looking forward to this, all the shenanigans coming this weekend? Right, okay. So first of all, let me talk you through. Horrific. I need to come over here. I've got this bad candy poster here. Oh, look at oh. that. You can see all this crap that I've left around here. That was covered by my back previously. So... <laughs> Romford Independent Film Festival, we refer to as RIF. Mm -hmm. What we decided to do, Romford Horror Independent Film Festival, chuck it in horrific, and you've got a tagline, but we are technically just Romford Film Festival, Romford Horror Festival. Horrific oh. is like our tagline. But then the idea being is each year we have like a variation of that. Terrific. Uh, nice. And then that way you're you're kind of like you're you're branding it in a passage of time with a slightly different tagline. You do realise though, if you just put terrific, it's just gonna look like terrific, the terrific film festival. Well, obviously. <laughs> And that I was a nice. I, and that's what it is. So. I don't understand what you're saying here. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a nice little nod. I'm so glad you put Bad Candy in there because we will be joined by the directors of Bad Candy a little bit later on, which is going to be shown at the horror festival. How did you guys get on with this movie first? Because we're going to be talking to them later, so we'll do this now just in case they don't like what we say and they don't get to hear it. No. So basically, it's, it's an anthology, isn't it? It's an anthology horror film. Yeah. I think there's uh, is it eight, eight to ten sort of mini stories um, and it's kind of the framing device is there's a, a DJ and a producer in a, in a radio on a radio show at Halloween in a small town and they're the ones who are recalling these and retelling the stories from the local area of Halloween's past basically and all the um, horrific things and there are some horrific things that happen uh, to some of the people in the town over the years so yeah it's a, it's a fun film definitely like the, the, the main word i would get from it is fun it's always you know as the nature of anthologies is always a varying sort of um a theme and if you don't like one of them you'll you'll like the next one and yeah there's some really really there's some good deaths it's always good there's some very good deaths <laughs> and yeah it's something for everyone in this really definitely and there's some sort of quite well-known people uh, dotted about here and there in it what i really what i really really enjoyed about it is those opening 10 minutes very strong yeah cinematic beauty and it's like and i don't want to downgrade the film but it's almost like they threw the kitchen sink in that opening 10 minutes mm. and it's kind of hard to go back once you've already thrown everything into that 10 minutes so such beautiful uh, cinematography, staging, um, the little girl walking up to the treehouse, mm. all those candles, and just beautiful. Like it reminded me of a film from about ten years ago called Trick or Treat, and nice. and and I, that's how I felt. But at the same time, I'm also reminded of there was a, I think there was a film called The Christmas Horror Story with William Shatner. Uh, around the same sort of time and it had a similar feel to that yeah the opening bit is very sort of 
the soundtrack and the the sort of the glow of the cinematography the glowing cinematography is very 80s isn't it very 80s mm. puts you in mind of stuff like it or you know goonies or you know and the fact that there's a small group of friends as well obviously stranger things is a, is a retro kind of uh, callback to that but yeah all that kind of that theme going on so let, let us not forget the sweets <laughs> <laughs> yeah never forget now, I, obviously i'm not don't want to spoil it for anyone but let me just say the man with the sweets is my kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> so bef before we uh, before these guys come on and we're going to talk a little bit more about the movie i want to talk about the festival properly first so Spencer, where, can you give us a little rundown on, on sort of your background and how you came to be with this festival as you are the poster man, as I say? I kind of like to push that title off onto others uh, <laughs> wherever possible. Um, you know, it, it, this is this. I mean, Rumford Film Festival is definitely much, definitely very much my beast. And some people have come and joined me. And, you know, like they're doing a lot of the, the, the tough stuff during the festival and I'm doing a lot of the tough stuff on the build up. I think with Horrific, I think this is something we've all, and you're included in that, Kevin, we've all created mm -hmm. together. We have all equal standing in this scenario. And, you know, next year, some of the stuff that happens pre-festival, I might be able to palm that off onto Peter um, or Bradley or Louise or whoever and build that. You know, at the end of the day, this is this is a relationship that has uh, six people in it. Um, we six people was the, the, the front line. And then, of course, you've got Billy, who isn't he's going to be present most out without doubt during the first festival but his film work is picking up quite a lot um so yeah i mean it's it this i hope everyone that attends is going to have a really good time we have picked a nice selection of brand new indie films and mixed it in with some classic indie and some blockbuster movies to kind of create a feel that doesn't necessarily happen in the smaller independent film festival world. Um, I was not saying that we're trying to reinvent the wheel, but you generally tend to find that something something is all new or all old, kind of put those two things together and hopefully provide every, you know, hopefully we've created like a really nice environment for people to enjoy new and old and to be able to provoke conversation, particularly when we play Manos on Saturday lunchtime. I mean, <laughs> seriously, it's got one of the lowest ratings on IMDb. Let's just chuck that in there for shits and giggles. Yeah, I had a look at this the other day. I think, is it less than two? I think it's less than two. Yes, it's, I think okay. it's 1.3 1. 1. or 1.4. Yeah. But it's... I've it's, not seen it myself. I'm looking forward to it. It is a... It, it's so, so, so bad. And when I say that, I'm not talking Mother's Child World Cup heist bad. I'm talking <laughs> so, so bad that it is actually good. Um, this is... Like, all, they are often the best ones. This is just... This, to me, this is like the room. And I think that as many festivals that can, that can champion the atrocious film, better it will become... I particularly like the girl that has the 50 year old's voice and she's supposed to be like eight. <laughs> and the guy that is the human version of Mr. Tumnus from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, who unfortunately, allegedly died as a result of his performance in this film and injuries incurred. You can literally say someone gave blood for this film. <laughs> uh, in the most extreme sense and i shouldn't downplay someone's death i know it's not very nice but it's just you know people felt passionately about this film at that point in time like any independent filmmaker does now and they were prepared to do things that probably they shouldn't do in order to get the film done peter <clears throat> You, 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 and I, and and Spencer, and some of the other people that Spencer mentioned before, Bradley, and Louise. You know, when we let's not talk about Shibble, but uh, we we all uh, are part of this awesome panel that I just 
last year when COVID hit, I had nothing to do, and Spencer was awesome and kind of brought me in to to watch all these films and sit and have chats. Which I kind of thought, do I really want to be sitting on Zoom till two in the morning talking about these movies? But you know what? It was an absolute blast, and I loved it. it so being being part of this panel with you for me has been brilliant. But how did you? come to be part of the festival and uh, what's kind of your background as the master of film? Yeah, so um, I live in Romford, so I'm extremely local and um, I've always had a great passion for films. Um, yeah, that led me to do, I chose to do a master's at Birkbeck in world cinema. So my sort of area that I enjoy the most and have studied is very sort of, um, you know, it's international film from from all around the world, especially Japanese cinema. That's my big like, mm. patron. That's what I did my dissertation on, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, and for the last couple of years, I've been working on different film festivals here and there, um, mainly in London, but, but all different ones around the town, all different types of film festival. And I found out about Romford being on right on the doorstep. And basically, I approached Spencer and said, like, you know, I've got you know certain qualifications in films, but most of all, I, I'm passionate. I love films. I love watching films, talking about them, all that kind of stuff. You know, do you need any kind of help at all? And um, I think it took him by surprise a bit. He didn't really know quite what to say because he, I don't think he was inundated with offers to of people approaching him to help, um, which, you know, I was very happy to do so. So, yeah, so as you say, Kevin, um, when we did the main festival um, last summer, obviously, I think it was sort of March or um, February of last year onwards, we were watching the submissions and things for the main festival. And yeah, for me personally as well, it was a great um, distraction, if you like, from all the stuff that was going on in the world um, last spring. And yeah, it was a great opportunity to see some independent film and some really, really good submissions. And obviously we were lucky enough to hold the festival last year physically. Mm -hmm uh back in was it september time wasn't it yeah we we even had some filmmakers who came as well we did some interviews with them in this in the studio that we made so yeah that was really the yeah the five day festival last year was really really good fun uh, as i say watching all the submissions and meeting some of those filmmakers was a great great distraction for me personally and i think for all of us no, it definitely was. It definitely was. I had an absolute blast just jumping on Zoom and sitting talking about these things in the way, like, I, I love the fact that we all had very different opinions on oh, yeah. on certain <laughs> movies. And yeah, it, like, but the, the best of it was, though, as well, like, there was a lot of respect on the chat as well. There was there was no real arguing. Yeah, OK, I've got an axe to grind when it comes to shivel, but that's just me. But uh, we we all so we all feel wrong about that film, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we we will at some point um, be getting Bradley on the on the show and Louise as well, and hopefully Billy at some point as well, and anyone else who works behind the scenes to talk about the festival and everything. But tonight we were we were here just to kind of talk about horror fic 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 fic. fic, fic. <laughs> Over, over, over the over the time that you have been helping with the festival, Peter, what would you say is quite possibly the best thing you've watched come through this festival? The, either the, the the new horror festival or the main one. Extraneous matter. It's a big question. I was that I was going to get onto that in a minute. Um, well, yeah, last year obviously we did have um, Shibble, which won multiple multiple awards. So that was the big sort of winner last year of the main festival. Um, in terms of the horror festival, um, yeah, I mean, as Spencer said, Extraneous Matter is one of my favourite shorts uh, from this year. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, it's a Japanese um, film about a neglected uh, housewife, let's say, and she has a very special friend um, <laughs> hidden in her apartment. And I will leave it at that. But yeah, I mean, if you like things like Tetsuo, the uh, the Iron Man, or uh, any kind of Japanese sort of cyberpunk horror, then I think you'll enjoy that one definitely. If you like anything that's very very weird, um, and also I should actually another shout out to another horror one war would be Piglet's Tale this year. Mm. Uh, I think we're all universal in our praise for that animation that we've got this year 
it's a short it's around 20 20 25 minutes i think from memory um but yeah that that goes in some unexpected directions from where it starts off that, that was a funny one because it, it is an animation and and while i'm doing these things like i'm always like i've got three young girls so i'm always trying to like find new things to watch with them and i'm yeah. sitting there thinking oh this is a really cool animation i could i could watch that no i can't watch this with the yeah girls. the first 18 minutes <laughs> are perfectly suitable for your daughters but the last two would would not be it's, it was really funny <laughs> for me because while none of you could see each other's comments, I could see everything. And I'm watching, and it was as if you were all quoting from the same book. <laughs> uh, oh, my God, that's dark. And um, someone wrote, grim, grim in the grimmest way possible. <laughs> And 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 yeah, you look at that beautiful animation. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> there was a few moments sort of on the way, and and they dropped in a few little hints, and I just thought, oh, did I? No, surely no. I can't, no, I don't think that's what they. They're not going to go there with this. And then another five minutes would pass, and I'd sort of forget about it. And then when you get to the end, you're like, oh shit, yeah, they've been what they've been sowing that seed from from the beginning mm, uh, well, mm. and i was right to be suspicious so spencer i know for the most part especially when we're doing the the panel and the judging and the and the selection and everything you stay pretty neutral to be fair until you absolutely have to um what have you seen in the the horror festival that you are really looking forward to people checking out i have to immediately put my flag up for parker um <laughs> <laughs> and everyone, every we always have wrestling matches over Parker, because yep. um, there are some issues with the the, the 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 focus. But I feel that the story is just really good, and the, that end scene just magical. <laughs> I really, really, really loved for sale this year, mm. and. Of all the subtle hints laced all through the story, um, and like even like you have to be looking in places you don't normally look. You need to pay attention to what's in the background to get the story before you get to the kill. Um, so love that, really love that. Um, Peter and I both really enjoyed a particular part of Leash, um, which is a I say shout out to Leash because two of us really loved Leash, and I think the other two really hated it. It was a real divisive <laughs> one. I think it's yeah. very much on your taste. It's very much what you're sort of into. And yeah, there, there, there's for me, there was a particular sound at a point in the film, and I'm watching it at home with my cinema sound, and I'm just like, oh my fucking god, that's scary. And actually, how often, I mean, Peter, how often does that happen? That you watch a film and it unsettles you. And it, the, ner the hairs on the back of my neck proper went up. And I'm just like, wow, this is fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing that in the cinema at the weekend. I'm really looking forward to seeing that with the cinema sound. And obviously, I loved uh, Extraneous or Extraneous Matter. Um, that was right up my, my alley. Mm. as well as obviously up the same alley as everyone that was in it and, <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. so. talk about Barry in the lead <laughs> he went there. <laughs> uh, yeah and, and and obviously there's 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 greatness all throughout the festival and i have yes. to say that because we've selected these films but we've got films that are shot with nothing and achieve so much and then we've got films that have very large budget and they are they're like a, a step further in their career and they're focusing on you know those bigger aspects of filmmaking you know i've got to give a shout out to the the what i i always call them the ice cream on the beach guys yeah <laughs> who knocked together a short film on an iphone down the allotment remind us of the title of that film oh i really can't remember <laughs> but i know it had something to do with an allotment yeah something i i so, scream in the allotment yeah uh so for those of you that don't know the allotment is actually going to be a segment in a film called mosaic which is an <laughs> anthology that is being put together and has some great names 
And when I say great names, I'm not talking like the classic big names. I'm talking about great names in UK horror, UK horror indie scene, who just turn up in these little cameos. But all these people, they're off making their own films. But they've all kind of come together in a show of camaraderie for UK filmmakers. Let's all just get together and let's give ourselves to these films. Tony Marden mentioned this guy. We, he's the lead in the allotment. He's doing something very, very similar, which is in the sand. But he's also including some of the greats. Eileen Dietz, for example, who you can see. And a whole host of other guys, Giovanni Lombardo Radic, and you know, all these people are just amazing. And I really like that when all these people get together and they make something beautiful. And even if the story, you know, doesn't add up to everyone's wants or desires, it's just that that camaraderie of people getting together that i really love it's it's one of the things that i i've loved about um doing the podcast and for, for for the last five or six years is is that the british independence scene does seem to be a lot like that you do you do get the odd person that very much isn't like that but for the most part so it's always cool to hear that there's uh, there's new projects coming through like that and and I'm, I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for that one spencer or you could always just slip me a cheeky link i will do <laughs> so spencer tell me what does what does a socially distant film festival look like i mean we are we're we're quite lucky because um things are slightly different now so what we had to do is we had to do a, a, what we call a density test in the cinema mm -hmm. to figure out the um the amount of people that you could fit in there um, and then how we're going to do that is we're going to put people in rows, but we're going to put, you know, like we'll say we'll say to someone, OK, we're going to sit you on the end of this row. Is that OK? Put them. If it's not OK, we'll move them further down. But the idea being is you only have people on the ends of rows. Um, but not every row. We're going to mix that up a little tiny bit. So obviously the amount of people that we have this year is going to be less. But with a touch of luck. By the time we do the Romford Film Festival at the end of the month, those uh, limitations may have listed a few days earlier. Um, the other thing being is we're only going to be doing one in-screen Q&A. All the rest mm. of them are going to be done in our little makeshift studio upstairs, as they were for last year's film festival. But we're going to make sure we position everyone at a good distance for that first Q&A. And that is for BHS Forever. Once Upon a Time in Camden, which is obviously uh, a, a, a story around a store that operated very, very close to the Camden Bridge. And yeah, but as I say, every, other than that, there's going to be lots of Q&As, but they're going to be done in the same way as last year, taking people out the screens, taking them upstairs, doing the interview, putting them out by um, YouTube, Facebook, etc. the day are. Yeah, we want everyone to have a really good time. We've got some fun and games up there. And uh, our good friend Pazuzu here is uh, <laughs> going to um, pay a special visit because what we're actually going to do is we're going to be having a competition for Pazuzu. Not this one, but another one. And the reason why I say not this one is because the wonderful Eileen Deeks will actually sign it for nice. you. Um, so she will be uh, giving one of these up to a member of our audience that answers a question correctly. And she will then send it to you, uh, signed directly to the winner. So we've got that. <clears throat> we've got a couple of photo opportunities um, that are going to happen. Uh, interesting backdrop. Some interesting awards. Mm. And, um, and fingers crossed... Should the delivery arrive tomorrow, some nice branded T-shirts. Ooh, I like the sound of that. <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, you you may have seen earlier on. I put a post up on Facebook and etc. with the postcards, and then mm. on Instagram, I put a post up with the bad candies. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's some badges, there's some posters, um, uh, some glow stuff some dvds uh and blu-rays um yeah just a little bit of fun but the main part is we want to give people a really uplifting 
uh, two days in a cinema having a lovely time and just kicking the shit out of the what's happening and just mm-hmm. enjoying being together for the first time in a long time. I have to say I'm I'm massively excited for you guys because um, obviously you, you'll have probably been in a in a cinema recently anyway. But I was in uh, Edinburgh on Wednesday and I went to the cinema with the girls and that was the first time I'd been in a cinema for eighteen months and it was awesome. I think we will because I think I was counting earlier. We got sixty two shorts and ten features to pack into two days. So yeah, there's going to be a. Yeah, that's- a lot of bums on seats in the cinema, which is brilliant. That is a bit mental, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> We'd organise such a thing. And, and, and I know, Peter, you said that you can't wait to see Leisha on the big screen because obviously that, yeah. that massive sound effect. But what are you most looking forward to seeing on mm. the big screen? I probably um, one of the classics that Spencer's brought into the programme because it's one I've not seen. And we're not talking about Manos again. We're talking about um, a Messiah of Evil. Hmm. Because I've never seen it, so I'm really looking forward to to, to taking that in. Yeah. Nice. I I am um, I am thrilled to bits to have been given permission to show this because we are actually the very first place in the world to see this newly restored version. So, you know, big up for Romford. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just such a, an adrenaline-filled film with some really disturbing scenes and some really disturbing characters <laughs> all wrapped up in an LSD-induced coma, for want of a better word. But it's, I, find, I always find it really unsettling. I watched it for the very first time about 10 years ago. There used to be an app called American Horrors, and I watched it on there, it, it, and it was in the middle of the night. And I remember, even on my phone, seeing the power and thinking, "Oh my goodness, this film is so like it gets you right here." And why isn't why haven't I seen this before? Why aren't people talking about this film? It's amazing. So, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick little break um, while we wait for the directors of Bad Candy to show up and we will have a little chat with them about their movie. I personally can't wait for this weekend to happen for you guys. Obviously, I'll still be up here, but I'm going to be watching with with a close eye on all of the social media. And I hope everyone just turns up and you're inundated with people. Obviously, not too many people because, you know, social distance and whatnot. It's still a thing, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully the whole thing goes amazingly. We will be back in two minutes. Um, the people from Bad Candy. Welcome back, kids, to the Psychotronic FM Halloween show. We continue down this dark and dusty road on the night when the space between the living and the dead is at its thinnest. When devils and demons walk amongst us. When the skeletons in your closet come looking to play. You guys ready for tonight? What do you think you're doing? Nothing. Remember what happened last year? (laughs) This is Chili Billy on 66.6 FM. I got the really good candy. So yeah, that was an awesome little coffee break, guys. We'll just play off the fakeness just like that. Uh, we are now joined by director of Bad Candy, Scott Hansen. Uh, he, this movie is going to be showing at the Horror Festival, as we spoke about a little bit earlier in the show. Uh, how are you tonight, Scott? Doing great. Doing great. I'm, uh, Fre- fre- fresh from working with Morgan Freeman, I hear. Yeah, yeah, uh, working with Oprah today is kind of cool. And, uh, mm, look at you. <laughs> from uh, do you remember Lewis from uh, Iron Eagle? Like, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Lewis and uh, Morgan Freeman and just some interviews. It was kind of cool for uh, Apple Plus shows. Cool. Nice, nice. This is my side, wow. my side world, you know, my side work, I guess. And then movies is my uh, goal one day. I was going to say, obviously, that pales in comparison to being shown at the horror festival this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm like super. I do a lot of like, you know, camera up and DP directing, you name it. But like, everybody knows me as that horror guy on the side <laughs> making these weird movies. And that's kind of what I look for. Uh, but, you know, my day job is all of that professional stuff. Oh, yeah. You've got, you've got to have your day job. Yeah. Well, <laughs> But if I can make killing movies and just weird Halloween things all the time, that that's the goal, yeah. You know? The goal. Definitely, definitely. So we've already spoken a little bit about Bad Candy tonight and some of our favorite parts of the movie and everything, but what we didn't really talk about too much about was what the film really truly is. In your eyes and in your words, what is Bad Candy about? Man, Bad Candy is just a love letter to some of my favorite films, like anything from Tales from the Crypt, Gremlins, uh, Growing Up with Trick or Treat, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, it's just, you know, I with Bad Candy, we were like, there, we just figured there's not enough Halloween movies. We love Ho Hocus Pocus, you know, we love all the Tim Burton classics. Trick or Treat came out like 14 years ago. And, you know, there's a Halloween movie every few years, and so that's it. I mean, I was just like, how fun would it be to make a movie about one fucked up street on <laughs> Halloween with all these people intersecting, kind of like a, lo a love actually meets Halloween, you know, and that weird <laughs> mix where it's like all these people are connected, but they don't really know it, but they're all like within a mile of each other in this small town. And that's kind of what we went off and... You know, we're huge fans of, like, Crash, Love Actually. You know, we try to stay away from the anthology vibe. would be more like a linear movie. Like, like you know, there's a beginning and end, and everything connects. Uh, but, you know, it, it's going to get grouped in as an anthology, but we tried to make it like a, a regular movie, like, you know, episodic, mm -hmm. four or five parts where everything flows creatively, and, and there's a good flow, you know, and there's a beginning, middle, and end, and a twist at the end. And that's kind of how we approached it, to be honest. <clears throat> I think the the anthology anthology side of it, yeah, it, I think it does kind of get lumped in that because it has kind of that neon sort of eighties vibe, sort yeah. of going over the top of it. And of course, uh, what was it scary movies to tell in the dark came out a year or so ago. So obviously, people are going to lump that in. But I love the analogy of uh, the love actually of horror. I really like that. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. I love that movie, and you know, I love all movies, but it's like. You know the ins you know you just got to be inspired by that and obviously trick or treat I know like the back of my hand and uh, I love the one you just referenced uh, uh, the uh, Alex Olaf I can't remember yeah. how to pronounce his name he's awesome uh, Troll Hunter I love Troll Hunter you can't awesome movie. yeah you, you can't get enough of Troll Hunter uh, but uh, but you know he had like fifteen twenty million dollars and we did Bad Candy on a hundred and twenty grand so you know it just shows like how things are moving you know we didn't have a studio it was all personally funded and just from us doing gigs we live in atlanta georgia so we work on movies save money and we shot this on the weekends it's truly an indie movie to that degree like straight up hey let's shoot saturday hey let's shoot next saturday and sunday and see what we can get and then but i you know i used every connection i had you know i owned some cameras some gear um but to do that to do what you saw for 120 grand is just like bonkers. Like, mm. you now if I would have had 15 million, holy shit, I can't even imagine. Like, so and and when I tell you who we're trying to get for the sequel, we can talk about that later. Uh, you know why I'm trying to raise some more money. Uh, but we are trying to do a sequel right now. <laughs> I, I said earlier on before you joined us, those opening 10 minutes of your film. I just, I, the, the only thing that I can possibly compare it to is trick or treat. So oh, okay. amazing that you've, you've, you've brought that up straight off the bat because to me, it feels like it, this is like a, a di direct relation to 
trick or treat. So I think that's fantastic. And yeah, lots of treat. In some ways, having watched both films relatively recently, I almost mix up elements of the story between the two. <laughs> um, Take that all day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> it's fantastic. And, you know, a great, great film, great tribute, an amazing opening sequence to the yeah. film that really, you know, really struck a chord with me and it looks absolutely stunning on a big screen. Yeah, thank um, you. You've, you said that you've raised all the money yourself. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to put the money, to put the film together? And then did you... Was it very much kind of like piecemeal where you might have had three or four months between getting your next bit done or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we took 18 months to film uh, like a 30 day shoot. <laughs> Cause it was literally like uh, my day job is like, if you see my site, I do a ton of music videos for big metal bands, rock bands, and then I'll do documentary stuff. So I'm like doing these slipknot and, you know, like as lay dying metal videos and all these bands and i'm literally saving money to like oh i'll do it for this and save budget to to throw towards the movie uh because nobody wanted to fund it it was you know it was very hard um this is my third feature uh, and to get it to get movies funded in general i just you know it's always like you're like a used car salesman trying to pitch the world to somebody and i was just like we did have one uh one investor but he just helped out a little bit but uh it was still like me and Desiree, we just funded it ourselves. And she works for Food Network and Netflix as a production manager. So she was just like, she go do her show and save money and be like, hey, we have like seven grand saved for this shoot. Let's uh, let's do it. We can do it. And we would pick the actors off and, uh, you know, set everybody up. And I think we cast it for like six, seven months. I would say overall, it was about two years worth of work uh, to the movie. Uh, but definitely – Probably about 28 days spread out over 16 months with, you know, post production But uh, just a little by little, inch by inch. And, uh, you know, even the the big creature, like there's a giant bat creature in the movie, uh, which is like my favorite part uh, costume-wise. Uh, but like that guy, Wayne Anderson. Mm -hmm. If you look him up, he did, the, he did the damn Predator suit on the Predator years ago. He did Jurassic World. And he literally... I literally like I'm a huge my background is special effects. So I have like anytime I do a movie, it's like I give the special effects guys all the time they need, all the money they need that I can raise or get to them. But my uh I always go way over the top as, as much as I can just because I relate to that world. Uh, but Paul and Wayne, Wayne is like he's like he's like the Rob Bottin. You know, Rob Bottin did uh the thing in nineteen eighty one, you know. Mm -hmm. And tons of epic 80s movies, but Wayne is like that guy now. And he literally, it was an email. I emailed him. He was like, hey, uh, I know you're on Avatar 2 with James Cameron in uh, New Zealand. I got this tiny, low budget movie that we can't afford you, but we need this giant back feature. And he's like, hey, I'm working on Kate Winslet's Avatar. I have, you know, I'm free in, in two months. And so we booked him a flight from freaking New Zealand, from Weta, to fly in. To do this giant back creature which he had already pre-made um and yeah it was amazing like pulling somebody like that stature onto a hundred and twenty thousand dollar movie is like unheard of and just lucky and it shows and it's just you know it's just a crazy that's that's amazing how we but it took a lot of work you know and we got kind of lucky Sorry. It's definitely a question that I had for you. Um, obviously, like the movie is lower budget, and you're saying 120k, which is mental. But I said to the boys before when we were talking, the VFX and the practical effects in this movie are just stunning. It's for what you've made it on, just unbelievable. So it's it's great that you brought that up as well. Yeah, I'm from that world, and I I just we try to give even the puppetry. We had Shane Morton who did Mandy uh, with Nicholas Cage. Mm. He did the uh, the cheddar goblin, and he was our our little I get a uh, little creature in the in the beginning. The girl she has a power; anything she draws comes alive in the scenes, and uh, she makes this little monster. And Shane Morton uh, from Screen Lab made that for us. And he was in the green screen suits with the puppet tree and making it move and walk and turn, you know, and scratch at the door. But like it was all green screen, you know, and we did it there and just keyed it out and. 
you know, tried to make the movements as best as we could. But it's kind of a shout out to Gizmo, I guess, you know. Uh, or like, yeah, but he did a Cheddar Goblin, so he was already really familiar with uh, puppetry, you know. So it was kind of cool to bring him in. But he's a local, so that was easier than getting Wayne. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think um, I was going to talk about the some of the actors you've got in this. Obviously, Corey Taylor and uh, and Zach Galligan. Yeah. Um, I think you, you mentioned that you work on the Slipknot videos, so that's probably how you approached uh, Corey, I'm guessing. I mean, you yeah. correct me. Um, but how did you get um, Zach? So, yeah, it was crazy. And uh, rest in peace to Sid Haig. We actually had Sid Haig walk. Oh, man. And that was, that was going to be right before Rob Zombie did Three From Hell. We had the script sent to his agent, and – I was like, yeah, we got Sid. He's gonna be the perfect guy. Not, not, and I love Zach. Zach did a great job. He did, but he was totally our fill-in, and he doesn't. He knew that, but he was like, hey, I'll, I'll fill in because I know you almost had Sid, and Sid died. But Sid was our original. Even in the concept part, we had Sid. Well, we had Bruce Campbell and then Sid. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, Bruce Campbell was. Uh, he wanted to. He wanted our entire budget for like a couple of days. So. You know, that's who we're trying to get for the sequel right now. So we're talking to Bruce uh, about a potential sequel. And then, uh, but yeah, I, I went back to Corey. You know, I reached out to Corey's people and I was like, hey, I know you've done some acting stuff and we just need you to be yourself and be a DJ and you're a, a metal singer. So how this, this shouldn't be too hard for you. And he was all about it. He read the script and he was like, yeah, I'm fucking in. Uh, as long as I get to keep the chili belly sign. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, we sent that to him and it's in his house. And he, he was like, uh, I was like, we'll burn it down anyways. If you think we'll make a giant sign, like a whole background or something. Um, but yeah, uh, and then Zach, Zach was uh, amazing. Uh, Zach had recently moved to Atlanta. We weren't sure if he would do it. Um, I hadn't seen Zach in anything in years. I think the last movie I saw was like Black's work or. Um, I just had he's he's done a lot of other things in some TV, and I was like, hey man, like we'd love to have you as this guy, and you know he's, he he looks great for being fifty seven. He looks amazing, and uh, we reached out to him, and he was actually a Slipknot fan, which is I think how we got him. <laughs> so that was kind of funny, um, but yeah, he came out, and uh, but yeah, we had Sid. We were like this close, and he just got really sick. And he passed away on us, and it was really unfortunate. But I can't imagine that, you know, you can only imagine what that would have been like with Sid, you know, three, you know, so I don't know. But I, th I think the, the, the two DJs are absolutely brilliant together, but man, Sid Higg, that would have been. He just had it. it. You know, it was totally like a House of a Thousand Corpses, just wild, yeah. and funny, and fucking don't give a shit. That Sid all day, and just, you know, I can't imagine. So. But yeah, rest in peace, Sid Haig. And, but you know, I think we made it out with what we had. You know, they were definitely backups. You know, but um, you kind of work with what you can. You know, and my my goal is just to make a good movie A to B and uh, like Halloween to the core. Because I mean, we're the we're the weird people in the neighborhood who put out you know 150 pumpkins and like every Halloween decoration you can imagine, and <laughs> people drive past our house and. They're like, oh, the Satanists again, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, these guys with the crazy power bill and all the Halloween decorations. That's us. That's me and Desiree. Um, so, yeah, we just, we're just we pretty normal, but we love weird shit. You know? Oh, yeah, you have to. You've got to have your thing, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, it's cool. It's fun. Um, in um, in terms of the stories, obviously it's a, it's a, it's being lumped into the anthology side of thing, and it is a series of stories that you're being told in a linear fashion. But where did these stories come from? Were they completely original that you guys made up yourselves, or was it things you'd heard over the years and sort of retconned them into your movie? Or where did the concept actually come from? Yeah, it's just just me and Desiree bouncing stories off. Uh, we uh, uh, we almost had another actor named D Wallace. Almost nice. ID. It was so close. Um, she was supposed to be in the ending story, but we just timing wise, she was on another movie, and you know, we just I tried my best, but uh, we might. I'm gonna try to get her in the sequel because I love D, and I've I've worked with her before on other stuff, but uh, but yeah, all the stories are original. Um, uh, we just 
we we were just like uh there's a few other stories we couldn't afford to tell yet that we're probably going to save for the sequel but we just wanted to center center it around like a very like a halloween town kind of vibe this weird town called new salem you know it's out in the middle of wherever and it's just like a a lot of magical stuff and weird shit happens and uh, we try to get a bit like a modern spin, you know, very hocus pocus vibe. Hmm. And, uh, but yeah, everything's original. Um, and, uh, because I, I've seen other stories with like radio hosts and, you know, you got like the tales from the crypt or like, you know, that kind of stuff, a creep show. Um, but I've never seen stories that make the host part of the movie. And yeah. uh, in this movie, you know, when you get to the third act, you're like, oh, wait. These, these, you know, not to spoil anything, but you kind of realize these guys are connected to the story when you think you're watching just what they're telling. And we kind of connect yeah. in a fun little way just to kind of, and then that's how we try to get past the anthology vibe where it's like it's a linear movie, but we're going to get grouped in the anthology. There's no way around it. You know, just how it goes. But. I think you should just lean into it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. You know, bring it, bring it on. But we, you know, I just don't want people to be like, "Oh, it's a Blue Mouse anthology, yeah. it's all like night vision, running around with a camera." <laughs> it's like cinematic. It's you know, looks, it's lit. Um, you know, Georgia weather in Atlanta is crazy. Like that one night with the Bat Creeper, I think we had like five inches of rain that turned into sleet and snow. And me with these pumpkin head guys and women. Uh, you know, I was just like, you know, sometimes I try to do funny things to get the best acting out of actors. And I was like, they were in the studio and I was like, hey, guys, it's pushing 33, 34 degrees. You guys are going to be in your underwear and pumpkins on your head running around from the giant creature, which nobody had seen at the point. Nobody. They just heard there was a creature coming. And I just, you know, I kept everybody away from Wayne and uh, I got everybody ready. And I was like, all right. You're not gonna have to do much acting. You're just gonna react. It's cold as fuck. It's it's raining, and it's the snow is coming in a few hours, and we had snow come too, and so but like tying everybody up and having the the rain come and all that, and then they see the creature. We just had we had a couple of people just like the reactions were golden, like just so yeah they hadn't seen it, and it's just like reacting this the wingspan, you know, the wings pop out 18 mm. feet, you know, and it's just like, it was all like in camera. It, was, it wasn't visual effects. Like, you know, and I just wanted them to get that reaction um, on set. And I think that, you know, these guys are running for their lives. <laughs> really, it's kind of funny when you see, uh, when you see the sequence, but uh, yeah, I, nobody expected to see that giant back feature. Too. Yeah. <laughs> just, just out of interest, how long did that scene take? Because, you know, there's such complexity in that scene. Yeah, yeah. We only had two days. I can only afford Wayne for two days. I'll be honest. That's all I could get him for. Um, so we had two nights. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just like we went through a lot of different actors. And the biggest thing is making sure we had to make foam pumpkins because we tried real ones and they just kept falling off and smelled like terrible and you could not breathe out of them that well. We, did, we tried it. I was a test dump for that. Um, but, uh yeah, so we went film pumpkins. But yeah, two nights we filmed everything in that scene um, uh, with just the monster. It took it definitely took two nights, um, but it was it was a lot of fun doing that and having having somebody coming off Avatar two, yeah. three, four, and seven. I don't know how many damn avatars there are, but he's working on all of them. Well, and uh, he was just telling us James Cameron stories. And I'm a huge fan of Weta. I've shot New Zealand a couple of times. So, you know, just kind of working with people who are connected. I mean, James Cameron is like, you know, Aliens <laughs> best movie for me. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. And Terminator, Terminator 2, you can't beat any of that. Titanic's incredible. You know, I, yeah, so anybody coming off of his team, I was like, can we steal you for two days? Is that cool? <laughs> so, uh, he was excited because, you know, like, and it's interesting here in his point of view, somebody that big who has done Jurassic World, with Chris Pratt, Don Avatar, and they come to this tiny low budget movie. He was just like, tell, and this was amazing to us. He was like, you know, I'm I work with all I work with all these big special effects companies, but coming to your movie, you guys treated me incredible. I had a lot of free reign. I didn't have producers yelling at me. I didn't have like this crazy shit that I have to deal with on these million dollar 
movies and he was he was just interesting here in his perspective coming to the you know tiny low budget movie that was super professional because we all work in the industry but we just didn't have the budget you know he probably spends 120 grand on one day you know for for crafty or whatever you know i don't know so um but he, he wayne had a great time you know and it was really awesome work with him that's so, great i think it's great testament to that thing that you can approach somebody and providing you approach them in the right way yep you more often than not actually get the right reactions don't you and i think what you've done here is testament to that that you've gone out you've pretty much approached everybody and pretty much got everybody that you've gone to but you've gone about it in a nice way yep and you've managed to pull together this thing because at the end of the day nobody knows where the next halloween's coming from do they you know <clears throat> and that's that's what i think is fantastic you know you ask the right questions you get the right people you pull it all together do you have any guidance for budding filmmakers to encourage them to kind of follow their dreams or particular ways that you went about talking and approaching people yeah i mean i i get asked that all the time and i'm not successful yet i i'm still climbing up the ladder but i appreciate it um but i just tell everybody to uh you know, if you get into the movie business, it's it's a, a long, hard road, and you're going to be broke for a long time. But, you know, if you see your vision and you want to stick with it, I mean, consistency and, and just staying and trying to be, you know, you're not not every, you're not going to be the next uh, James Cameron. You, you can't, you just got to be yourself. You know, you got to stay true to yourself and bring your own vision. And that's how I was with, with Bad Candy. I was like, I don't have a budget. I can't get legit investors, you know, and, you know, here a uh, damn pandemic hits and the world goes under, you know, it, it just topples everything. But I, I would just tell people to be consistent and work your ass off. And I literally, my day job is working with, you know, documentaries, music videos and stuff. And I would just save as much as I could um, and just keep saving and just do little by little. And uh, luckily, Bad Candy has le uh, led to uh, a couple other big. I have a sci-fi movie uh, coming up in August. That's like my biggest budget ever, and that's nice. kind of off Bad Candy. But uh, that one's called Hoax Fall, and it's a uh, sci-fi horror. So I'm really looking forward to that because uh, we got Michael Bean. We're talking to Michael Bean right now. Nice. And I love Michael Bean, and I've you know <laughs> only met him at cons, and I was like, hey, man, we can afford you. What's up? So you know, I just. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, you know, you just got to work hard. And it's, I can't tell you, I, I've been doing this for 12 years, you know, and it's, uh, it's not easy. There are, there, are, it's really not easy at all. And uh, with Bad Candy, you know, we, uh, we sold to the, uh, we sold the movie to uh, Epic Pictures, who did Terrifier. Um, so they're going to give us a pretty good push. And Terrifier became, you know, the next Jason. Yeah. And I was just, I love Terrifier and I was a fan of, of that um because we were shooting that right as that came out um and i was just like cool we're on the same you know distributor and uh we have a clown our clown is more uh more you know we're not killing people we're not murdering kids but our clown is like the good version you know he's uh <laughs> anti-hero so I, you know and i thought that was more fun uh for us just because it works better for our story but uh uh, and, and we and we got a 300 theater release, which is insane. Wow, budget! And well, that's in the USA. Yeah, um, uh, like 300 drive-in movie theaters. So in September, mid-September, we're going up against uh, Candyman, which is amazing because that's Jordan Peele. And then we go up against Halloween Kills in the next week. So we're <laughs> going to get the handed to us, definitely. But I mean, just to be in that in that world, like, hey, you're going to be Halloween movie going up against probably the best Halloween series of all time, Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis. And then we're going against Jordan Peele, who's like a horror icon right now with, you know, Get Out. And he's, I think he just produced Candyman. So this, uh, we're, we're the little movie that could going up against these big movies. And if we do well the first week, they would extend us. They plan to extend us. Um, so I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm just going to keep pushing it daily and, uh, we've, we've won a bunch of film festivals, you know, we've, uh, won, I think a lot and, uh, you know, just 
I, I the film festival world. I would tell people you got to do the film festivals, you know. And I love going to them. And fortunately, with the pandemic, I come to y'all's. Uh, but I've always I'm always there, which kills me. I don't even know if you guys are open over there, but uh, I don't think so. Yeah, right. Not open. We 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 kind of open. Yeah. Our, yeah, I mean our cinemas are open. Obviously. Oh, cool. Um, and and we are one of the first film festivals to be running after That's lockdown amazing. has lifted. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of moving in the right direction. That's good. Fingers crossed and touch wood. All right. the social distancing stuff could end on the twenty first of June. Yeah. So fingers crossed, either next year or the year after, we yeah. can actually get you into sunny Romford with whatever your next uh your okay. next film is yeah i'm excited yeah we're talking to bruce campbell right now so I'm trying to he said no at first now i came back and I'm trying to give the sequel so he'd be awesome <laughs> is that not the moment where like you just turn around and say you said no the first time so we ain't gonna ask you the second time pal he actually <laughs> liked the uh he liked the script but he just he didn't know who we were and yeah. just, like you know he, he needs this so much per day. And I was like, no, I get it. I understand. And they don't do the one day thing for, you know, somebody of his stature. He's going to do like a week or, you know, three days. So I was like, I'm going to come back to you. Let me get this out, see what happens. And then I'm going to make a professional offer when I can. And maybe he'll have heard of it by then. Or maybe it just crossed the desk, you know, and uh, maybe he'll be easier to get. But he, he said uh, it was like a no, yes. It was like, you can't afford me. Come back, and I'm like, I'll be back. We'll get you. Awesome. <laughs> I, I will not stop until I, 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 I meet a brick wall. So I had a, a technical sort of on-set question. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's there's two of you, you yourself and uh, Desiree wrote yeah. and um, directed this, right? Yep. Yep. How does I'm always fascinated. How how does it work with two of you directing on set? It's uh, it was this was our first time directing because she directs a lot too. She does like. The bigger stuff, um, like she did, like uh, uh, a lot of Food Network show, Netflix shows, where I do a lot of more short film, and I've done a few other features. But coming together on this, we just thought it would be interesting to try it. Uh, and, and you know, we're kind of like we're, we're we actually get married in September, so it's kind of like you know we live together. We all we do is talk horror, and she's like really weird like me, so it works out great. Um, <laughs> But, like, you know, there's a couple scenes in the movie where, you know, uh, there's a character uh, who uh, has too much LSD, basically, and she has fun with a corpse, you know. And <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite scene, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, and that scene was hilarious because, you know, it was just like, you know, it was just to, to do that, you know, to do it professionally is tough. Uh, but when you have a woman on set, it makes it a lot more comfortable for the other woman, you know. And so – kind of approaching like that um because desiree she's a screenwriter i'm a screenwriter but um yeah it was it was interesting we had different duties but i think it made us stronger um and it was definitely a lot, a lot less stress because we were putting the bill so we had full control of all time and when we wanted to shoot we didn't want to shoot we're not going to shoot uh or we couldn't because we didn't have enough money yet we had to keep saving um but it was it was a great it was a great combo but yeah, I always see like double directors. I'm always curious, like, how did that work for you? Or, you know, mm. it, it, I've heard good stories and bad stories, but, you know, we're, we're pretty pretty equal and we definitely uh, champion each other. Uh, and when we're writing the script, I mean, we had three walls in the house. I think all the walls back here, you can see some storyboards in the back over there <laughs> where that's the sequel. Yeah, we're already starting to storyboard and concept art. Uh, but we had like three walls covered and I, I draw. And so, like, I draw the storyboards out, try to get all the sequences down. And uh, he's more good with the logisticals. And oh, how much is that going to cost? How much is this going to cost? So it works out. It must have been a positive experience. That you're still together and getting married. So yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we made it through the movie. So, yeah, made it through deliverables, which you know, that was to give any advice to uh, anybody coming up. You know, save all your money for delivery. <laughs> That's the most expensive part. Is putting in different languages and uh, closed captions, and that's that's the worst part of filmmaking. But it's you know to sell a film properly, you have to know 
how to do all that. And that's the business side of it. So we're going to start wrapping it up now. But um, the, the movie Bad Candy is going to be showing at the Romford uh, Horror Festival this weekend. Okay. Um, you, you guys are up for three awards for yeah. our festival. Which, which ones is it again, guys? Best Feature, Best Director or Directors, and uh, Best cin- Cinematography. Awesome. Nice. nice. Really nice. Cool. Yeah, well, big I'm honored that you guys had us because we couldn't do it without you. Um, and I, I, I try to tell people, like, the, the festivals are everything for people like me, you know, that nobody's heard of us. So I appreciate you guys. You, know, God, awesome. say, you were one of the first films that we actually had submit to our festival. Um, and when you get a film that's as strong as yours, you know that you're on the right track to greatness, so to speak, in yeah. terms of the other films that followed along in your wake. So yeah, I mean it was a real it was a real high point I think for us in terms of the submissions, you know, at just start like that. So thank you ever so much for submitting yeah. it to us. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah, cuz this is the first year of the the horror festival as well, so to get something as as good as this, yeah, it's it's a buzz. <laughs> I wish I could be there for the next one. So the pandemic will be over hopefully. We're going to hold you to this. I will be <laughs> your yeah. next film. We don't forget, like like uh, Ruth Campbell. We're not going to forget. We're going to ask. We're gonna keep asking. But Scott, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank Bad Candy is a movie that I feel like across the board, we all kind of got on board with, and we've all enjoyed talking about during our little panel discussions. So, yeah, this has been awesome. Nice, and we're like this close to getting it in the UK theaters. So Thank hopefully you. that works out too for September. October, like, well, you're in the best UK theater this weekend, so yes, <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. I hope there's some scouts there and they see it and they're like, Oh, we need to. <laughs> yeah. is, is there anything you guys want to add on, or are we okay just to kind of wrap out there? I think the only thing that I want to ask is someone mentioned to me the significance of a certain comic in your film, okay. Um, in terms of how the story pans out, um, obviously, I, this is something I know nothing about. Um, but I'm told that this is like quite a significant part of your story. Okay. Is, first of all, is that true? And secondly, um, how did you, without revealing too much, how did you? come up with that idea to include this specific comic. The first appearance of Punisher, which this cat right here, this cat destroyed that comic, so I was able to burn it uh, in the scene. Uh, I burned it. I know people are going to be like, why did he burn that Amazing Spider-Man first appearance of Punisher, which I threw in there for any comic book fans like me, uh, but it's because my cat ate, ate it and destroyed the value. Uh, anything paper he destroyed uh, so the, sig- the significance of the comic is more personal than actual story yeah I had it I had it like in good condition for years and it just like the plastic came off and then he destroyed it and I was like well I need something cool for you know a little throwback to like 20 years ago and that was appropriate you know and I, I hated burning it but it was definitely there he burned it <laughs> yeah, I mean, the person that brought it up actually said, because if you think about the character, that bears great significance on the film. Oh, yeah, totally. That's crazy. Somebody picked that up. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> so that's one of our judging panel. Bradley, well done. You got that right. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Can't let him have any, anything, can you? Yeah. Right, right. Okay, then, Scott. Thank you so much for doing this. This has been absolutely okay. brilliant. Thanks and, for uh, Again, we are showing... Well. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm excited to hear about that, definitely. But, um, yeah, man, we'll, we'll just let you go and uh, we'll just crack on with, with the rest and we'll, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for your time and have a good festival this weekend. I'll be there digitally. Yeah.